All right, today we're going to talk about Green's theorem. Okay, so we've broken this out into an introduction. We'll talk a little bit about circulation, circulation and divergence, and then we'll get into Green's theorem. Okay, so as an introduction here, do a little bit of foreshadowing and say, okay, curl is the tendency of a fixed particle to rotate within a vector field, if you kind of zoomed in on that one little particle. Uh, divergence is the tendency of a fixed particle to expand or compress within a vector field. And then Green's theorem, well, this is going to allow us to turn line integrals over closed curves under certain situations for non-conservative fields into double integrals over the region enclosed by our curve. So think of the curve as the boundary to the region. And oftentimes these double integrals are simpler to do than the line integrals, or possible, whereas the line integral may not have been. So just to state some assumptions before we proceed, um, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about two or three space for this lecture, we're going to uh, label our field as M is the X coordinate uh, component function for the vector field, N is the Y component function, and P as the Z component function, whether you're in two or three space respectively. Actually reverse respectively, because I said uh, them in the opposite order. Now, we've seen the Dell operator before, but it's just another reminder here that a nice way to think about the, well, and remember formulas for divergence and curl is to think of this operator del as applying partial derivatives to each component. Okay, and I posted a bunch of links on the course site with specific links, but I really can't remember, recommend highly enough the material covering circulation and divergence for an intuition as to what these things mean um, on Math Insight. So circulation, just briefly, uh, let's talk about curl. The curl of a vector field is the tendency of a fixed particle to rotate within a vector field. So kind of microscopic rotation. You've zoomed in really, really far and you're just focusing on that one little particle. And this differed than the general rotation of the entire vector field, which is what we think of as we look at the vector field kind of a far or macroscopic big picture rotation. So the following calculation gives us the axis vector about which a particle in space tends to rotate. So the curl of a vector field is the, the vector which gives an axis about which a particle in that vector field would tend to rotate. And since we've got three components here, we're working in space. And you can think of, remember the curl as uh, the del operator crossed uh, with our usual definition of the cross product for vectors uh, with our field F. Then you have i, j, and k across the top, and then the del operator providing partial of, of x, partial of y, partial of z. And then, uh, the component functions for our vector field M and NP in the last row. And if you go ahead and calculate the cross product here, uh, you'll see this, you'll get this funny looking expression down below. And instead of reading it, I'll let you do that. It's a quick exercise to calculate that cross product and it may be worth your time. Okay, so now when And we're, what happens, that was in this space, but it turns out that if you uh, slap zero in for the component function for uh, your vector field, so instead of thinking of a, a vector field in three space or in two spaces, just MN, you think of it as M comma N comma zero. And then you calculate the curl from the prior page, realizing that your any partial with respect to Z is always gonna be zero because there is no Z component. Um, then you get this, this formula. So, Curl in the plane, think of it as looking down from the Z perspective, imagining, you know, right-hand rule, think of the tabletop that you're, imagine a tabletop with your thumb placed on it, right-hand rule for that. Then the tabletop's the plane and your thumb's sticking straight up as the Z axis and you're looking straight down on that Z axis onto the plane. Then the curl will be given by just the kth component of that, that um, formula from the prior page. So let's pop back there and you can see that, whoops, that was two clicks and you can see that this right here is the kth component of our curl calculation. So in the plane, if your vector field is in the plane and you don't have a third component, this is actually equal to just the curl of a two dimensional uh, vector field. So when you calculate uh, this value, the curl of a vector field in two dimensions, if you get a positive, output, because this won't give you a vector, this will now just give you a quantity. If you get a positive quantity, you have counterclockwise rotation in the plane. 
And if you have a negative, you have clockwise rotation. And again, I said it, but I didn't write it down. So here it is at the end. Note this curl of a vector field. And this is the curl of a vector field in a plane. And you can derive the formula by setting the zth component to be zero, and then noting that any partial involving z will also equal zero. And you'll get that the curl of a two-dimensional vector field is the partial with respect to the y component function. Uh, wait, the partial of the y component function with respect to x minus the partial of the x component function with respect to y. So let's work an example. Um, let's work an example of circu finding circulation of a field, a vector field uh, given by zero in the x component and y in the y component. All right, apologies. Uh, wouldn't be a lecture with me if I didn't have a typo in one of my slides. There we go. I don't think there are any additional slides here. Yep, so that, that, uh, that correction will stay. Yeah, that should be y in the x component and zero in the y component. That is correct now. This is shearing flow. So what's gonna happen here? Well, let's just imagine that we were to put a particle in this vector field. What if we put a particle right there? Well, it's pretty hard to imagine something that small. So just kind of imagine it's a little bit bigger. So I'll just draw a circle around that particle. With the vector field acting on this, the, the magnitude of the vectors on the bottom are much smaller than the magnitude of the vectors on the top, so to speak, with positive y being the top. And so I suspect that this, this particle is going to have a tendency to rotate in the clockwise direction. So let's see if we get that by calculating the curl. OK, ready, set, let's go. Well, um, we decided that notationally we were going to use m and n for the x and y component of our field, respectively. And so let's find the, form the formula. The formula for the curl of a two-dimensional vector field is uh, a partial of the y component with respect to x subtracted the partial of the x component with respect to y. And so we're going to take the partial with respect to x of the n component, of the y component. Well, that's 0. Yeah, we're just substituting in here. And then we're going to subtract the partial with respect to y of our x component function. Well, that's m. That is y in this case. And so what do we come up with here? Well, the derivative of 0 with respect to x is just 0. And the derivative of y with respect to y is just 1. And so we get negative 1. And recalling that a negative curl uh, tells us that a particle in our vector field has a tendency to rotate in the clockwise direction. OK, divergence. So divergence is a measure of flow, expansion, or compression of a vector field. We think of divergence as the total measure of fluid flowing into and out of a region in a vector field. If exactly as much fluid is entering as leaving, then we'll have zero divergence. If more fluid is leaving than is entering, and things are expanding, we'll have a positive divergence. If more fluid is entering than leaving with the compressing situation, we'll have a negative divergence. Um, divergence is calculated, so the divergence of a vector field is calculated by uh, applying this del operator and dotting it with the vector field itself. So that would be, you could think of it this way, del del x, del del y, comma del del z, and that's a vector we're thinking of it as. And then f is given by m and, and p, and dot prodding those things together, you're going to add up the partial applied to m, added to the partial of y applied to n, added to the partial of p um, apply, uh, partial with respect to z applied to p. Tongue twisters. All right, so let's work an example here. Oops. Yeah, that was supposed to be two slides. So find the divergence of a field here. We've got uniform expansion. If we look at this field, the x component is 2x, the y component is 2y. We see that close to the origin, you're going to have 0, 0. But then as you move out from it, the vectors are all kind of expanding out away from the origin. So let's calculate the divergence of this. The divergence is given by dotting that, that del operator with our vector field. And so we're going to take the partial with respect to x of our x component of our function. So the partial with respect to x of 2x and add to that dot product and add our 
uh, add them together, the partial with respect to y of the y component function 2y. And so partial with respect to x of 2x is 2, partial with respect to y of 2, y is 2, and we get 4. And so note that if we were to just take any little region in the plane, you know, this is about zooming in on a mic, like a tiny little point, but just make it bigger for example purposes. And you can kind of look at that and you can say, okay, yep, there's going to be some flow into this, but far greater of it is going to be expanding out. So we have a positive divergence. All right, and that brings us to Green's theorem. So what is Green's theorem? Green's theorem is an alternate way to calculate certain line integrals along certain closed curves in the plane. So the setup is R has to be a closed bounded region in the plane with piecewise smooth boundary C. So our curve is the curve that we've been dealing with C uh, for regular line integrals. It's a closed curve and it, it bounds a closed bounded region space R in space. So like, for, to just give us an example, we could have something like this. Here's our curve. It's a nice little curve. And since it's closed, I'll, I'll give it a, I don't know, an arrow clockwise, counterclockwise orientation there. Um, and then the region R is going to be this interior region that this curve bounds. So given that setup, let R of T be a vector file a param parameterization uh, in the counterclockwise orientation for our curve C, and let M be our usual vector field. Notice it's in the plane. It's only got two components, just the X and Y components. Uh, we'll see later that we can sort of ex uh, extend Green's theorem into the space, but for now, we're just starting in the plane. Um, different name. Okay, so our field is uh, M for the X component, N for the Y component, and it's got ten continuous partials on our region R for each of those component functions. So then here's Green's theorem. Uh, it says that you take a circulation, uh, circulation integral um, and you can write circulation integrals like this. And then uh, we can turn that into a double integral of this. And why is this thing called circulation? Well, this right here is the circulation, no, not circulation, I'm sorry, the curl. Let me erase that. This is the curl of our vector field, which is why I put that down there. There's another version of Green's theorem, and all of the conditions are the exact same as before, and this one's called the flux divergence form. And we can use this one to calculate flux line integrals. And so why is it called the divergence or the divergence form of Green's theorem? Well, this, the double integral, integrates the divergence of our vector field. So summarizing those two formulas, you have the circulation curl form of Green's form, which is sometimes called the tangential form because it is related to and comes from uh, circulation, or our regular old kind of regular general version of a line integral over a vector field. Uh, usually, oftentimes, Green's theorem is applied in situations where you have integrals that look like that. Um, and that's why I colored these orange for emphasis. And again, the flux divergence form, sometimes called the normal form, because it comes from a flux integral, which involves a normal uh, vector. And I didn't say it, but I meant to say it, sometimes called the tangential form because a circulation uh, line integral involves a tangent vector. Okay, so let's do a couple examples. Uh, our first example, we're going to evaluate the line integral along C, which is the square cut in the first quadrant bounded by X equals one and Y equals one. So not a bad thing. This will disappear once I advance the slide, but you know, to start, that means that this is what we're looking at. This is our curve. Our curve is, let's do it in red here. Our curve is this. And since greens requires us to uh, 
traverse this in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction, rather, we would orient our uh, parameterization like that. See, I'm going to take a, just a, a small tangent here and say it can be hard to determine what clockwise is in the plane. So, uh, for example, if we had a curve that looks something like this, and we just decided, okay, clockwise seems like it's, or anti-clockwise seems like it's this direction. But wait a minute, this, when we turn the corner here, all of a sudden, I'm going to use red here. Uh, we'll use blue for a different color. These blue, when we're walking in this direction, these actually are clockwise until we then turn the corner again, and then we resume kind of anti-clockwise motion there. And so as a convention, we decide that uh, counterclockwise is if you have the interior of your curve should be on your left as you traverse the curve, and the exterior should always be on the right. And if you look at that and think about walking on that curve, you would notice that you have, in fact, got your interior on the left and the exterior on your right. And so that's how we define um, counterclockwise for complicated closed curves. Like the square doesn't have much ambiguity, but that curve example does. OK, so if we wanted to tackle this thing as a line integral, that would be kind of a pain in the neck, right? We would have to do four different lines. We'd have to parameterize all four of them. And then we would have to add them up using the piecewise additivity of uh, line integrals over smooth piecewise curves. So in this case, it's probably going to be easier if we could turn this thing into a double integral over the region that is in the interior of our curve. And so now we're ready to ask, which can we apply Green's theorem? Well, our uh, our curve is piecewise smooth. It's a nice behaved curve. It's this square. And the interior of that square is, is definitely connected and nice, a nice region. So yeah, we can apply greens. And so we have choices here. We say, OK, which version of this do we want to apply? Do we want to apply the circulation form or the flux form? Uh, well, just initially looking at this, um, let's see. We've got dy dx. And so you could say, well, I want to use this version. And you can absolutely do that. Just to make it fit this format, you'd have to say, OK, m is x, y, dx, plus, and you'd have to make sure that you include that negative sign with your choice of n in these calculations over here. We're going to work this uh, to show this, emphasize this point. We're going to work this example twice using both versions. And yeah, you can, you can maybe see that I have the circulation version uh, typed in there probably should have left that off of these example slides. OK, so I took off, so gave myself a little bit more room by labeling our curve. Our curve used to be C, where everything's 1, traversed like this. And so the interior of this, that's going to be our region R. And so I chose to write R as x varying from 0 to 1 and y varying from 0 to 1 as well. OK. Now we're ready to tackle this thing. Let's give it a go. So we got the circulation form. I find it helpful to kind of write it out here. So I have it to look at. And so we'll just start to work right underneath it. OK, so m I'm going to replace with negative y squared because it's the thing that's attached to dx. And so I'll put it first so it matches the format. And now uh, n, well, n is attached to dy here. And so n is going to be, well, that's positive, so there's no problems there. We're going to have x, y, d, y. OK, so from over here, I sometimes find it helpful while working these problems to say, OK, my choice of how I'm setting this up, m is going to be negative y squared, and n is going to be x, y. That way I can look over there and see quickly rather than trying to decipher it from the context of the problem. OK, now applying greens means that I can turn this integral into this. And I'm just going to rewrite the version of greens. We're applying the circulation version of greens right underneath here. I'm not going to worry about the limits of integration. We'll worry about that later. For now, let's figure out what the derivative of these things are. OK, so to do this, don't be tempted to just uh, I don't want to 
do something I can't do. So I'm going to do something silly here. It's going to make a really long line. Don't be tempted to just go straight down because the way we set it up, negative y squared is actually m, not n. So be careful there. All right, so looking off to the right at my green for good uh, cheat sheet, uh, the partial derivative of n with respect to x is going to be just y. Now the partial derivative of m with respect to y is going to be negative 2y. And again, you know, algebra matters. Be careful with your signs there. OK, so our double integral becomes uh, equal to the double integral over our region r. Sorry, I should have been writing the region r there. Uh, 3y with respect to area. And so now this becomes a relatively simple double integral to do. So we'll do it. Over here, we'll do the inner integral. And we'll just give ourselves a space to put our final answer. OK, so our inner integral, well, integrating 3y, I guess we should set up our integral, shouldn't we? Let's do that up here. Uh, it doesn't matter which order you do this in, because we're integrating over a, a rectangle. So you can set it up however you like. I'm going to set it up like this. I'm going to go y on the outside, x on the inside. Do it the other way. No big deal. You'll get the same answer dx dy. So we're going to integrate the inner integral. We're integrating with respect to x. That's going to give us 3y times x evaluated from x equals 0 to 1. That's going to give us 3y times 1 minus 0 is 3y. Now it's time for our outer in integral. And so our outer integral, I'll write this one out. y is equal to 0 to 1. Our integrand is going to be 3y dy. This is going to be 3 halves y squared evaluating y from 0 to 1 is going to give us 3 halves. So our final answer here is 3 halves. Not a very good 3 or a 2, but we tried to fix it. All right, let's try the flux version of this integral. So now we're ready to, we just need to look at this and say, OK, how can I rearrange this to make it match Green's theorem? Sort of a game of substitution, if you will. Um, yeah, and, and this really shouldn't be there. OK, well, this one, there's not much to do. It's already set up the way it is. Look at that. That's kind of nice. OK, so I'm going to make my sort of cheat sheet over here. m is equal to x uh, y, and n is equal to uh, y squared. Have caution here. We do not include the negative sign, right? The negative sign in front of that negative y squared is already accounted for here. So I have caution. All right, so now I'm ready to say, OK, well, take this logic and say, all right, this thing is equal to that thing, which is equal to that thing. And we'll just continue working down from there. OK, so the partial derivative of m with respect to x, well, m is xy. So the derivative there is going to be y plus the partial derivative of n with respect to y. Well, n is positive y squared, so that's going to be 2y. And once again, we're going to, we're going to end up with, check it out, the, the same exact integral, y equals 0 to 1, x equals 0 to 1. And we're going to have 3y as our integrand, dx dy. We just did this, so we're not going to go through the integral again, because it's the exact same thing as it should be. So what does Green's theorem do? It allows us to take certain line integrals and collapse them down into oftentimes simpler double integrals. OK, let's work another example here. Our next example, we want to take a look. We want to find the flux of f. Well, in this case, we don't have a choice. We're told to find the flux, so we better apply the flux version of um, Green's. And in an effort to save myself a little bit of writing, I went ahead and copied and pasted the flux form in here. So now we just need to say, OK, well, how can we put all this together? Well, remember, M and M have meanings. They are, uh, well, let's write this to match the way it's written. We'll use the standard vectors. M i hat plus n j hat. M is the x component function of our vector field, and n is the y component function of our vector field. OK, so I really like making my cheat sheet. M is equal to 2e xy, and n is equal to 
y to the third power. So we don't have to set up the line integral. We know that's what we're after. And this, uh, what are we integrating over? This thing has continuous partials over a rectangle in the plane. Absolutely, no problems there. And we got a nice connected bounded region there, uh, the square from negative one to positive one in the plane. So our region of integration is going to be the interior of this. The interior of the thing bounded by our curves, our line segments. Again, if to do this as a line integral, we'd have to do four separate line integrals and add them together. But if we can collapse it down into a double integral, it's most likely going to be easier. OK, so now we've got it set up. We're ready to proceed. All right, so I'll just continue on right beneath here because we're going to make it equal to that double integral. We'll worry about the limits of integration later. And so the partial derivative of m with respect to x is going to be uh, e to the xy has derivative e to the xy. But we have to chain rule there. We have to remember to take it and multiply it by the derivative with respect to x of the exponent xy. So the derivative of xy with respect to x is y. To that, we need to add the derivative of n with respect to y. Well, that's going to be 3y squared. And I'm, I'm being a little fast and loose here saying derivative instead. I should be saying partial derivative there. OK, ready, set, go. Well, uh, the limits of integration for this thing, I'm going to write them once up here. And this is just because I don't think I gave myself an extra slide. To, nope, I don't have an extra slide. And so I need to kind of conserve room a little bit. So it doesn't, again, it's not going to matter which order you do this in. Uh, you can do whatever you prefer because we're just setting up a double integral over a rectangle. So I'm going to let x be our inner integral, vary from negative 1 to 1, and y be our outer integral, varying from one, uh, negative one, two, positive one as well. We're going to have our integrand, which we can see down below. And we're going to order, uh, integrate in this order to match our limits of integration. So now let's do that. I'm going to refrain from writing the limits of integration from here on out until I'm ready to evaluate the result of my definite integral here. So first things first, let's tackle this inner integral. The inner integral is 2y e to the xy power uh, plus 3y squared dx. Well, I'm going to break this up into two integrals because we can do that using integral properties. And why? Because the left integral is going to require a substitution. So the substitution we're going to use is we're going to say u is equal to xy and then uh, that's going to give us du is equal to the derivative of xy with respect to x. That's just y dx. And some people like to rearrange this, but I like to just algebra it out. Uh, you can algebra differentials to your heart's content. So we'll move the y over there to hang out with du, and I'll substitute directly in for dx. Doing that is going to give me an integral. Uh, 2y is not going to be affected e to the xy is now going to be e to the u power, and dx is going to become 1 over y du, just directly substituting it. Uh, what we expected to happen happened. Everything came out nicely, and we can now integrate it. So I'm going to continue along with this, this integral, and we'll come back to that for that sort of hanging right half of this, this equation over there and work that in a minute. Well, so the integral of 2 e to the u is going to be 2 e to the u, and then reversing my substitution, we have 2 e to the x, y power. Now we don't need to do as much there because the integral of 3y squared with respect to x gives us 3y squared times x. Now we're ready for those limits of integration. We know that we're going to evaluate this from thing from x equals negative 1 to x equals 1. Ready to fire up a little bit of algebra? OK. 2 e to the first power times y plus 3y squared times 1 minus parentheses 2 e to the negative first power times y plus 3y squared times negative 1 and parentheses. Keep tidying this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the tidying of this up to you, but 
do this and you will get 2e times y. That's not an exponent, that's a multiplication. I'll put a little dot there just to emphasize that. Plus 6y squared minus 2 over e times y. And so this lets us now be prepared to do our outer integral. And our outer integral is going to be the integral from y equals negative 1 to positive 1 of that expression, 2e times y plus 6y squared minus 2 over e times y. Now we're integrating with respect to y. Doing so gives us uh, e times y to the second power plus y uh, 2y to the third power, applying power rules there, minus 1 over e, just a whole bunch of power rules. All right, uh, evaluate this thing from y equals negative 1 to 1. And once again, I'll leave the algebra of that to you to verify. But if you do that, you will see everything works out nicely, and we get a very pretty number of 4. Now we're not finished. You know, we should be a little bit more clear here. Let's come back and say, all right. And so our final, our flux, let's just write it out. Flux is equal to four. And one last concept while we're talking about Green's theorem is so far we've been looking at really nice regions, but we can actually extend uh, Green's so that it works for regions with quote unquote holes. Um, they're connected, but they're not simply connected. So the idea is you can slice up a region into multiple multiple regions. And then since line integrals over vector fields will have positive result if you have a certain parameterization and a negative result for the opposite direction parameterization, um, the line integrals of those kind of shared boundaries where you made your slice will end up adding to zero. They'll cancel each other out, and you'll be left with just the uh, boundaries that you need. And the, what that does is that allows us to say, OK, well, since the line integral additivity works out just fine, then the double integral must work out just fine as well. And so you can break a piece up into two pieces and do two double integrals over that as long as the, I'll kind of emphasize it here. So. Let's say that our outcome across, I wanted to use blue there, the line integral across P4 is a positive value, then the line integral of that shared border in the opposite direction is going to be negative, that exact same value, and they'll add to zero. Similarly, this one's going to be positive and that one's going to be negative, they'll add to zero, and you'll be left with just the boundaries and as a result, just the interior region that you need. Now, this is a, a picture I stole straight out of the textbook, but there's a better way uh, for this particular problem. If you, if you have to integrate uh, the line integral over the boundary of this, this D region here, um, instead of cutting into two pieces, you can kind of cut it into one piece. And I'll show you why that works in hopes that applying polar coordinates is going to make your double integral easier. Hint, it will. OK, so let's just say instead of cutting it into two pieces, we just cut this thing right there. And uh, you know, you could kind of imagine now if, if you deformed it a little bit, your region would look something like that. And the line integral in this direction, let's just say for, for uh, argument's sake, it's positive. Then that's, that's in the opposite direction. It's going to be negative because we're integrating over a vector field. And again, over parameterizations in the opposite direction or opposite orientation, they're going to add to zero. So let's let's think about this. Let's uh let's go clockwise around this curve. Let's start at point P, and let's see. Yeah, it's all good. We're going to keep going like this. We're going to walk around. Uh, yep, as I'm going, the exterior of my region is is to the right of me, and the interior is to the left. And now when I get here. In order to keep the exterior of my region on the right of me, go up here to this broken piece. And regardless of that blue and red arrow I drew before, I'm now going to need to hang a right. And that will keep the exterior on my right and the interior on my left. OK, so disregard the blue and the red up here in the upper right-hand corner. So much so that I'm just going to get rid of them. 
so don't want it to confuse us. So I'm going to hang a left. And that left, I'm going to tra traverse this cut in that direction. That line integral is going to have, again, let's say a positive output. And then to keep the exterior on my right and interior on my left, I have to continue in this direction. So funnily enough, I'm actually walking in a clockwise direction to maintain a counterclockwise orientation. And now I'm back to that same cut speed. So I'm going to have to traverse it again, but this time to keep the interior on my left, think of it that way. And then the exterior, if we were to open it up, would be on my right. I'm going to have to traverse in that direction. That's going to have the exact negative value that we had positive from the blue one. So they're going to add to zero and I'll be right back at my starting point. I'll have traversed the boundary exactly one and where I've duplicated it, it's counteracted each other. And so this, if you do it, set it up like this, then you can set up your double integral will work just fine in polar coordinates with zero to two pi for theta and R is equal to your inner and R is equal to your outer. I'm just going to use the words inner and outer there for your diameters or radiuses of those two circles, respectively, dot, 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 D, A. And that brings this lecture to a close.